Um, all right, so the next thing, birds as insect control. Yeah, uh, I love what Sepp said. You mentioned Sepp Holzer earlier, uh, the rebel gardener or the rebel farmer. Uh, he had a great saying. I mean, that one, when I heard it, I went, man, he, he, he hit it absolutely right on the nail. He used to say, or he says, uh, if you don't want a pig to do the work, then you inherit the work of the pig. <laughs> yes. Like, if you don't want a pig to do the work, then you inherit that pig's work. And I thought that's that absolutely right. Like, you, oh, I'll, no, but I don't want to have a pig. Okay. Then what the pig absolutely loves doing, you're going to have to do that. So it's like, so now I've extended it. And it's, if you don't want to have chickadees in your garden, well, you're going to inherit their job. If you don't want wasps in your garden, well, you're going to inherit their job. Even I would say as far as if you don't want this and that weed in your garden, then you inherit the job of that weed. You say, come on, no, that can't be. Well, okay, you have a garden, you have a certain weed comes up. You say, well, the only thing I should do is pull it up. Have you ever stopped to think that weed is actually trying to improve your soil? You say, well, of course it is. Or you may say, no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Weeds are growing basically where they are needed. Like if you have a, a, a place and you're, you know, your planting is full, there's no place for that weed. There, it, it won't get established or maybe one little one here and there. So that whole thing about, uh, do you want to inherit that job? So that's why birds to me have been uh, really useful. Because for me, like I say, the biggest problems were caterpillars. And so I've seen now that with an abundance of birds, they do the summer, uh, the spring control. They take right. care of the caterpillars in spring. And then as the youngs have fledged and now they don't always stay in the orchard, now they start to disperse. Now the wasps take over. So by having birds and later wasps, I get excellent, I mean, excellent control of any caterpillars so that I don't do it. I, I don't have to do anything. What would you say to people? I mean, so I've had videos. I, I had a video once I called, I don't need ducks because often people watch my videos and they'll see I've got snails and, and, and slugs and something. Everything's mulched, right? And I don't use plastic mulch. I've got, you know, just yard waste. So I've got a lot of snails and slugs. And um, so people will say, well, you need ducks. And I'm like, well, I'm not in a situation where I can have ducks, but I don't need them because every time I go to the garden, there's birds everywhere, right? I'd rather have, you know, 10 sparrows than one duck. I mean, they'll do way more work. And I've got more, I've got hundreds and hundreds of birds out there, all kinds of different birds. And they come in and they're all over the place and they're, they're getting the easy food. And uh, I'll see them turn the mulch over, move it around, and they're looking for easy meal. I mean, they'll take some, they'll take some worms, I'm sure, but the, I'm pretty sure the snails and the slugs are the easier meal than the, than the, uh, the worm, because the worm can get away. Um, and there's a lot of worms that are just in the soil as opposed to like right under the mulch where all the slugs and snails like to be. Um, so, you know, but a lot of people say the birds are eating their plants. And maybe that's the case for some kinds of plants in some places. Um, but I think a lot of times people think the birds eating their plants when in fact the birds eating the thing that's eating the plant. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> well, that comes back to what we just talked about, the observation. Anytime you're jumping to conclusions, you know, you say, oh, well, it's this. How do you know it's that? Well, I saw it at the plant that's eaten, but did you see it eating? No, but I just, well, you know, that old assume, uh, be careful. And, and that's just, it helps to confirm your hunches and watch. And sometimes actually, uh, and people who aren't used to it, get a good flashlight and go out at night. Yes. Because you could be blaming what you see in the daytime, but hey, there's a whole other shift out there, you know? Oh, yeah. There's a night shift and it's, it's active. Let me tell you, if you've ever walked in your garden at night, 
it seems like there's way more action at night than in the daytime. You think, well, yeah, but the birds are, never mind the birds. There's still some birds, but there's a lot of other things going on at night. Oh yeah. And, and so, yeah, you can't always jump to conclusions. You know, I think if, if there's one thing I'd like people to really get in the habit of is not jump to the quick fixes. I have this, I'm going to use this. Like, Advertising, unfortunately, has been has drummed into people's reflex that, oh, you got this problem. Go ahead and do that. It's not always that simple, because if you do that, you often can create more harm than good, because now you start to unbalance the system that is there. For example, you know, if you go in and, and you let's say you bring in a duck to your yard. And now the duck, because it's, I call it, there's animals that are subsidized, <laughs> meaning the duck, yes, can eat slugs. But when he goes back in his pen or whatever, he would probably get some grain. Well, the birds in the wild aren't getting that same subsidy. And so you're basically making it, allowing it to survive and live through tougher times as opposed to the wild birds, which don't get that help. So if you have a duck, it'll probably eat up all that easy food. And some of the birds that we're relying on it, will all of a sudden, well, okay. I'm, I mean, I'm using that as an extreme example because yeah. sure, in a lot of cases, a duck could help. But you still need, I mean, a duck needs a little bit of space. We've raised 50 ducks on the farm. It's 12 acres. And they will go around quite a bit. We've tried anywhere from 200 turkeys to 15. And we found the number that it takes to really do the whole farm completely is about 20 to 25. Right. When I try to push it beyond that and I'd go to 50 or 100 or 200, that was too many for the capacity of the area. The carrying because, capacity. Right. 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 That's, I mean, it's a simple ecological concept, but it, it applies. It applies for domestic animals as well, unless you want to do a lot of that subsidizing, which is feed them artificially. Well, yeah. And I use a similar concept. I mean, I, I've got a sponsor for the show and they, they produce, you know, organically acceptable pesticides, savers. And, um, but and I'll, and I'll use some of their products in my garden, but I'll, you know, the videos I've done about it, I say, I use these things. So could I cover my entire garden with slug and snail killer and just eliminate the slugs and snails and not have a slug and snail problem? Probably if I reapplied it every two weeks all summer long, um, but I don't want to do that. I, I want them there. Like, you know, I'll use them in very, um, specific you know like if i'm planting a, a squash plant when it's putting on its first two leaves it's unbelievably vulnerable to slug so i'll put a few little bits of slug bait out there this one just breaks down to iron basically um just to protect it until it puts out the next leaf once it puts out the next leaves it's spiny and it's it's slug proof and then i've got slugs everywhere and snails everywhere and it doesn't matter and they're actually breaking down uh, all the organic matter on my so they're actually doing the work of worms and they're, they're helping to fertilize my garden. And they're not only that, but because they're there, they're every single thing that eats slugs in the area is saying, hey, this is a great place. There's slugs everywhere. So over time, because I've had, I have found, I mean, I, I started gardening here in 2014, 2015. Um, and the, the slug, and I've need like less and less and less and less work to manage them over time. Um, just the, the most minimal application to just get my plants established. Once they're established, I'd, I don't do anything anymore. And I noticed also if I space them out a bit more. So if I had kale plants, if they're really close together and there's a lot of fo uh, foliage overlapping, I have more slugs. If the plants are spaced out and there's more, more sunlight stuff coming through, it's easier for the birds to get in there. It's harder for them to, to, to hide. I mean, I'm not exactly sure if that's what the case is, but I know if I space them out, I get less slug and snail damage. I'm, I'm guessing it's because there's just, they're more scared because they're, they're, they're averse to light, but it's also just easier for the things that come in to kill them. I'm helping the things that hunt them 
hunt them. Just like if you were, you use the example of hunting deer. If you've got a thick, thick forest where you can't see, you're not going to get any deer. If it's a nice open forest with, you know, 50 yard sight lines, uh, that's a better place to hunt, right? So I'm just making it a better hunting ground for the things I want hunting in my garden. So I, I always say your goal with any sort of whatever method you're using to control your pests, your goal is not to wipe the pest out. Um, right. I mean, your goal is to, you know, protect the plant to, to whatever extent you need to, but just like you're saying, you don't want to do the work of the bird, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you have to do something, do something, but uh, don't take the bird out of the equation, you know, give the bird right. a reason to be around. I would bet too that from the first years when you came to now, you have now built up a lot of your predator populations oh, yeah. that are critical, like slugs, one of the most important, there's a black ground beetle that especially lives in mulch. And if you move mulch around, and it's only out at night, if you move the mulch around, it hunts when basically snails are moving around. I mean, that thing is voracious against, really? yeah, it's, it's in our big. Zone? It's, yeah, it's about a one inch, it's a big ground beetle. And that's one, that's its favorite prey is uh, slugs. And, you know, I, but it's that takes... those big ones. Like there's, there's, a, you know, like there's only so many big black beetles you see out in the, on the garden. That, Most that really, likely. Yeah. It's like the size of like, you know, a thumb. Sort of, of, yeah. Yeah. A tip of a finger. Yeah. Sort of right. thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. There. And I mean, it takes a pretty big insect to eat a, a slug. I mean, they can be pretty big and that's, that's what they do. And you don't see them in the daytime unless you're moving mulch and then you'll find it hidden. They especially like, an easy way to create habitat for them is to put a few sh smallish pieces of board, you know, a foot long and just put them in several places. And if you lift that in the daytime slowly, you'll see them sleeping right underneath that because it's insulating because a board is fairly thick. So it doesn't get as hot under the board. Right. And uh, yeah, that'll be just what they need. And then they'll come out and they have an effective radius of about, uh, what is it? Radius is one direction, diameter is both, yeah. That's a right. radius of about 10 feet. So, you know, three to four meters, it doesn't travel that far. But wow. think of it, this thing is, you know, it's that big. If it does that in the night to come back to its hiding place, so in a circle around, but it takes a while because these predators don't multiply like, you know, like slugs would or something else. No, they, the predator is always, I mean, it's an apex predator. So it's the right. last, last thing to the party. Um, you it. know, the, the, the herbivores show up and they multiply and they multiply and then something comes in eventually and starts doing some damage. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's why you're especially if you're just setting up. Uh, maybe you can talk about this a little bit. There's, there's I, I remember reading this. I just can't remember the reference when you're setting up one of these sort of no uh, permaculture garden, no till garden, but basically a garden that's covered in mulch. Right. They'll say your first year will be amazing. Your second year is a disaster uh, because, you know, all of your pests show up because right. you've just given them the most incredible place ever and you've got no predators in that second year. Is that a thing you've yeah. experienced? Yeah, because, I mean, that's a, a, a basic in ecology. It's a, prey have a, they call it an R scale or an R. Um, it increases like exponentially. The prey will, the pest basically is always prey they increase like just boom, they're up there. And the predator always, it, it increases slowly and it takes a while. So that's why your second year, your prey has hit peak, but your predator still, the population's still climbing. And it takes a few years and you're, you know, five, six, seven years, your prey now are being controlled by your pop predators, which have established a good population. And that's yeah, yeah. where, as you say, you know, be careful, be judicious. Don't overuse things just because they work. Use them where you need them. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, we trap insects, but we're being very specific the same. Target what actually can be damaged. If a tree has no fruit or has five fruit, let them get those five fruit. I don't care. But a tree that's loaded, I want that one protected better. So it, it's that same strategy. Well, since we're on that topic, let's talk about wasps. Why should we love wasps? I love wasps. I mean, it's crazy <laughs> to think, but they are the number one, you talked about it, apex predator. 
they're the top of the insect food chain. Like they're the wolves in, you know, in Canada or the bob or not bobcats, bobcats, not the top predator, the mountain lion, you know, they're, they're actually more like wolves because they are, uh, they form basically hives where there's many, some of them are solitary. You get big, like mud wasps are solitary and they catch uh, a wasp. What I like about them the most is the bigger the wasp, the bigger the prey. And usually if you see it, and I've watched many a times a wasp taking off with a caterpillar, yes. it will be the length of the wasp. Like they're, they're looking for one that they're not looking for the little one. If it's a big wasp, they, I've never seen them take a little caterpillar. They're looking for the one that's their length. And that's, I mean, you think of it, this thing is carrying something half its weight and it's carrying it back to the nest. Flying. So, it's flying. flying. With, yeah. With the like load. A, like a Sikorsky helicopter. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I always, yeah. I always look and you can see if it's got prey just by the way it's flying. Cause a, an empty wasp will just dart off straight and just go. But one that has a load, he can't even dart because he's not ra- rising fast enough. So he usually does a few circles just to get some altitude uh. to fly above the shrubs or the trees to go to the nest. So it's, <laughs> it's like, what? Why isn't it just, well, because it can't. It's just loaded down so much. So really, uh, I know a lot of people give wasps a bad rap and I've been stung by them. It's not like, you know, and the thing with wasps is you got to understand that they never voluntarily want to sting you. They just, they don't. A sting is a huge waste of energy. Like that takes them a lot of energy to inject that venom and to produce more venom. So what they're looking to do is they just want to protect their runway. And I've done this. uh, I have a video on wasps, why I love wasps. And it really shows people that if you have, and I mean, the, the nest that I was next to is, it's, it's a big nest. It's like just about basketball size. And I can be, you know, not even an arm's length away from it and right near it and watching it. But I've learned then through observation that as long as, and you watch them, just watch, they always have the same flight path. They all, if they're coming this way, then they're all coming this way. There's not one coming here and one over there. They all, this is their flight path. And it's like a runway. And I say to people, you know, look at, imagine the analogy, you go to your local airport and you start driving around on the runway. They're going to come and get you pretty quick. Not as fast as wasps. I mean, wasps, you've got about three seconds. (laughs) If you stand right in, like if this is the runway and you can stand off to the side and watch it and it's okay. But if you go, oh, look at them coming in. If you're in the runway, there's always wasps on the outside of the hole will come and attack you and just to move you out of the way because that's what their job is. Keep that runway clear because think of it, you know, that that heavily loaded one with a, it's not very maneuverable. Mm. Like don't ask it to zip around something. It can't, It's, it's so loaded. And by the time it's coming, it's probably pretty exhausted, honestly. So the others, their job is just keep that that space clear. So it's mostly uh, wasps. It's mostly caterpillars. But then there's a whole group of wasps that are parasitic. And the same idea. They now uh, drop an egg onto a caterpillar. They don't, they can't carry the caterpillar and they can put eggs on big uh, caterpillars. And so they'll lay an egg and the egg will actually eat that caterpillar from the inside out. And then the adult will emerge out of the caterpillar when it's ready. Uh, But that's, I call those mummified ones. So when we see caterpillars, yeah, well, the horror stories, you know, I'm sure you've seen horror movies and so on. That's, they're just going, what looks gruesome? Well, that happens in nature all the time. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i i, I like saw, caterpillars i saw so i think i was watching one of your videos talking about this and at that same time it was the summer and it's the time of year that my brassicas you know broccoli mm-hmm. kale start getting um a uh, problem with uh what's it called the white cabbage fly. cabbage the, moth the small white or oh, the white little, fly. little okay. white butterfly that 
yeah, you know, puts a cat, a perfectly camouflaged caterpillar on. And uh, so, I mean, my first couple of years, I didn't have any problems. Then one year, my, my plants were just like year two or year three, they were just destroyed by these things. And then I started using uh, BTK, right? So I'd put, you know, which is a bacteria. So I'd put it just two applications would all, all, you know, I'd put it on one evening, two weeks later, put it on again. And it wouldn't, you know, 100% eliminate them. But again, I was going with that idea. I don't want to get rid of these things because I want to bring in the things that, that attack them. So every year I do that. And I think the year previous to last year, I just did one application and it seemed to like just do an application to see what happens, right? So the previous year, 2019, I did one application and it seemed to be enough to get it under control. Now, last year I was sitting on my little bench having a beer or something like that. And something went by my ear. I saw a wasp go to a broccoli. I saw it land on the broccoli, look around a little bit. And then I, just like you're saying, when it got up, it, it didn't fly away, it, you know? And then it, I could see it had something, right? I said, no way, that can't be that thing he was saying. And then I, I watched another wasp came along, you know? And because people will say with these things, pick them off your plants. And I'm like, who in the hell has the, the dexterity, the visual acuity, the time to find those caterpillars, especially when they're juvenile? I mean, people say it, but, you know, I'm pretty in tune with things. And, and I'm, I'm very, you know, if, if it was something that, that was feasible to do, I would do it. Um, but I don't see how, especially if you, I've got like, you know, 30 kale plants you know, uh, a dozen broccoli, a dozen, you know, I got a lot of different brassicas, right? How on earth am I going to manage all of that? Picking them off. Um, well, there's something that's really good at it. I mean, it's, it's the same size. They're, they're, they're like, you know, uh, evolved to hunt and find them. They can probably see, smell and hear them. Whereas for me, I'd have to just see it. I've got one sense working for me. And I can't, you know, I just, I'm not geared for it. I can't get in there and look around. So over and over again, I'm, I'm noticing that I went over and stood right next to the plant and was watching and I saw one land and they were getting the sort of smaller juvenile ones, right? And flying away from them. And I thought, ah, it's finally happened. They're solving the problem for me. I don't need to do anything. And last year I didn't use any BTK. I didn't need to use anything on that plant. Um, so, you know, I've got, I don't know what kind of wasp that was. I should have gotten more footage of it. Um, but the problem was just solved for me by these wasps. So well, think of it, you have a nest somewhere, right? I'm aware. There's, and what's easier than finding, and in, in ecology, we used to always, always call it foraging by patches, because that's what it is. Food isn't distributed evenly everywhere. It's just not. Like you'll have a, one of your kale plants has five times more caterpillars than all the others. Right. Well, once the wasp has spent the time going over the 30 kale plants and found the one uh, this one has. So I suspect, I mean, did nobody, I don't know if anybody's actually studied this, but I suspect one of the reasons too that they circle is they make a mental map or, or mental note of where that kale plant was. Because bees good do place. that. Honeybees do that too. When uh, they orient by, they'll circle, they do waggle dance and so on, but they'll, they'll kind of, oh, okay, this is where, and then they, then they can relay that information. So for a wasp, if it finds a kale plant in your garden, that's got, you know, 40 of these caterpillars. Well, why should it go looking all over? It found that patch. It's just going to keep coming back until it empties. And that's what I've seen with birds. I mean, the best is chickadees, man, if they find a tree where there's a nest of these 10 caterpillars, within two days, I can't find a caterpillar in this tree. There might be one or two escaped somewhere, but they've cleaned it absolutely. But for two days, they're happy because think of it, you know, these parents, they've got to feed these young and the young never stop car, you know, calling for food. So once they find a patch that wow, we got 200 caterpillars in here. Those chickadees, they look at each other, they go, honey, we got two days off. 
What are we going to do for two days? Because it's super easy. They just go to the thing, pick up one, two, bring it, feed, come back. And they do this five times. All the chicks are full for 10 minutes. And now they can go take a, a dust bath or go for a drink or <laughs> a kick so back and watch uh, Netflix for uh, <laughs> now. <laughs> the chickadee version of yeah. Netflix. Was it, would you say the chickadee is the, the number one tent caterpillar uh, uh, predator or, uh, no. birds are, where birds are it's, concerned? It's actually better on some of the other caterpillars, uh, right. especially the little green ones there, like the, like the ones you're talking about in the kale. That's really, they really like those tough to see like I don't see where they're finding them but they're finding them <laughs>